Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning or good evening. I don't know which part of the world all of you are. Uh, today's webinar is uh, our topic today will be infection control in the audiology diagnostic. What do you need to know? Let me just start with, with uh, some... Um, sorry, I have a problem change the slide. <laughs> with the, the speakers from today and the moderator. We had a problem with our speaker today, so AU Baukatings will not be here. And instead of, of her, we will have Michael presenting, and I will ask him to introduce himself. My name is Mariana. I will be the moderator. Um, so, and, and some few tips uh, and tricks. All participants are mute. And this is to reduce the background noise. It's possible to ask questions during the session. You have a little bit, a little question box, and I will ask you to write down in this question box, and I will read in the end of the webinar. If we are not able to collect all the answer, all the questions or to uh, have a response for all the, que uh, the questions, I will send to you the response afterwards. If you had any technical problems, please write directly to me and I will try to see what I can help you with. So now, Michael, the screen is yours. I will try to change to you, change presenter. So, Michael, you got the screening now. Yes, perfect. Hello, everybody. Um, actually, Michael was the technical person helping me get online here this morning. Uh, my name is Bob Kemp. Uh, I am the uh, founder of Oak Tree Products. Um, I uh, started Oak Tree in 1992 and wrote the first book on infection control in 1995, um, and then have uh, co-authored uh, two subsequent books on infection control in the audiology clinic and in the speech language pathology clinic um, with Dr. Bankaitis over the last uh, uh, several years. So, let's see here. The objectives of this presentation are to answer three very simple questions. And can you all see my screen? I just want to make sure. Okay. The objectives of this presentation are to answer three very simple questions. What is infection control? Why do I need to do it? And how do I do it? What is infection control? As defined by Bankitis and Kemp, infection control refers to the conscious management of the clinical environment for the specific purpose of minimizing or eliminating the potential spread of disease, regardless of how remote that possibility may seem. Although this definition is very straightforward, the critical part of this definition is that it is a process that involves conscious management of the clinical environment. Infection control is a very intentional process that requires thinking through clinical procedures and assessing how those procedures may need to be modified to minimize the potential spread of disease. In other words, it forces us to think through how we may need to do clinical procedures, these clinical procedures that have become so automatic, it forces us to think through them differently in order to achieve these goals, which can be frustrating. However, the basic information outlined today should help alleviate any frustration in moving forward effectively. So why should we care about infection control? There are a number of reasons, including two very critical ones. First and foremost, audiologists come in contact with bodily fluids, including cerumen, and other potential sources of infection, bacteria, fungi, viruses, on a daily basis during routine clinical procedures. Number two, the nature of what audiologists do on a daily basis involves contact with many different patients using many reusable objects through a typical clinical day. 
these two things significantly increase the chances for disease transmission to occur. To put this in a meaningful context, it makes sense to mention the findings of a study published by Bankitis in 2002 that appeared in the hearing journal entitled, What is Growing on Your Patient's Hearing Aids? The purpose of this study was to explore what microbial growth could be found on hearing aid surfaces. Ten custom hearing instruments were randomly selected from the ears of ten different patients, swabbed with a culturette, and then sent to the lab for analysis. To visually illustrate the results, the ten blue circles seen in this slide represent each of the ten hearing instruments swabbed in the study. If I were to assign a specific color for each of the different microorganisms uh, recovered from these surfaces, we would start seeing something like this. Nine of the ten hearing instruments, which now appear in red, were contaminated with some form of gram-negative staphylococcus. It's important to point out that the species could have all been different, but we did not pay to have species further analyzed beyond gram-negative staph. In addition, seven other bacteria in different combinations were recovered as well. So if additional colors were applied to reflect this, now all ten hearing aids have a different color represent the unique microbial growth recovered from each of the ten surfaces. Furthermore, as designated by the squares with the letter F, four of the ten hearing instruments were also contaminated with varying degrees of fungal growth. Again, while each of these hearing aids all started looking identical as blue circles, when applying what bacterial and fungal growths were recovered from each surface, <coughs> all of these instruments, as indicated by the color scheme, look very different. Now, are these findings surprising? From one perspective, the correct answer is no, not really. If you take into consideration that the normal flora of the external auditory canal uh, contains most of these, uh, these organisms, it's not surprising to find them on the hearing aids since those hearing aids were in the ear. On the other hand, these findings are somewhat concerning from the perspective that the ear canal is very prone to infection. While cerumen may have a mild antimicrobial property, the efficacy of cerumen to minimize infection may be comprised, uh, compromised in instances where some aspect of a hearing instrument is closing off the canal, making the canal a warmer, darker, moister place that is actually more conducive to microbial growth. Also, everyone's ear canal flora is not the same and some of the recovered microorganisms from these hearing aid surfaces are not considered to be part of the normal ear canal flora. As an extreme example, hearing aid number seven tested positive for Enterobacter. Enterobacter is a bacterium specifically found in human feces. Keep in mind, if it's on the hands of the patient, eventually it will find its way to the hearing aid. So these hearing aids were contaminated with a lot of things that should not be introduced into the ear canal. So if you handle one patient's hearing aid without appropriate infection control measures and then handle another patient's hearing aid, whatever was on the first patient's hearing aid is transferred to the other patient's hearing aid introducing foreign microbe creates an infection control challenge and here's how. In order for microbial transmission to occur, two main things need to happen. A microorganism requires a mode and a route of transmission. A mode refers to how a microorganism travels from the clinical environment to the vicinity of the human body. In other words, how does the microbe get from point A to point B? In the audiology environment, contact transmission, whether direct or indirect, represents the most common mode of disease transmission. 
Once a microbe has established a mode of transmission, it then requires a route of transmission. Route refers to a portal of entry into the body. Common portals of entry into the body include dry, chapped hands, or any other skin surface that may be dry or have exposed cuts or scratches. In addition, keep in mind, the natural body orifices serve as portals of entry into the human body. These include the eyes, nose, mouth, and ears. Once the microbe enters the human body, a million different things need to happen in order for disease to occur. However, when it comes to infection control, our responsibility as audiologists is to control the external environment by performing diagnostic and rehabilitative procedures in a manner that eliminates potential modes and routes of microbial transmission. So how do we do this? Well, there are five basic guidelines that are designed to minimize the spread of disease, and they include, number one, wear pers wearing personal barriers. Number two, hand hygiene. Three, cleaning and disinfecting necessary surfaces. Four, sterilizing critical instruments. And five, disposing uh, infectious waste properly. Let's apply each of these to the clinical environment, starting with personal barriers. Appropriate personal barriers, including gloves, safety glasses, masks, and or gowns, must be worn when performing procedures that may expose one to an infectious agent. Regarding gloves, they should be worn when immersing or removing um, instruments from cold sterilant. They should be worn when handling hearing instrument that has not been cleaned and disinfected handling an ear mold impression removed from the patient's ear, and any time the clinician or patient exhibits visible cuts or wounds that may make direct or indirect contact with skin. Hand hygiene is the single most important thing you can do to minimize the potential for disease transmission. Hand hygiene should be performed at specific times throughout the course of the patient appointment, including at the beginning, anytime during and at the end of service, immediately following glove removal and any time as needed throughout the appointment time. Touch and splash surfaces must be cleaned and disinfected. A touch surface is any surface that comes in regular contact with hands, mainly including horizontal surfaces such as countertops, tables, armrests of the chair. Splash surfaces refer to any surface that may be exposed to secretions when, for example, a patient sneezes. Examples of items that should be cleaned and disinfected with an appropriate disinfectant after each patient use include the counseling table, armrest of the chair in the audiometric booth, headphones unless using protective barriers, bone conduction vibrator, the response button, any little object uh, that you had to touch the patient with. Critical instruments. Um, the fourth guideline involves sterilizing critical instruments prior to reuse. A critical instrument refers to any instrument introduced into the bloodstream. Any non-invasive instrument that comes in potential contact with mucous membrane or bodily substance and or any instrument that can, pen that can potentially penetrate the skin from use or misuse. Sterilization means that you are killing 100% of the organisms 100% of the time and requires the use of specific chemicals or processes that, given this short period of time, cannot be addressed, although feel free to contact me for more information as my contact email will appear on the last slide. While in oversimplification, any item that has potential to break the skin, like forceps or curettes, must be sterilized prior to reuse, pretty much everything else can be disinfected. Finally, infectious waste must be properly disposed of. Sharp instruments uh, should be thrown away in puncture-proof containers like a sharps container. Any contaminated waste, including disposables with cerumen, can be disposed of in regular trash, although it is not uncommon to place those items, if contaminated, with copious amounts of cerumen into some sort of a Ziploc bag, uh, disposing it into the general garbage. 
We covered a lot of information, and prior to opening up to questions, there are several good resources out there, including the textbook, Infection Control in the Audiology Clinic, which you can see on the slide there. You can also go to AU Bankitis's audiology blog that can be accessed at aubankitis.com. That's A-U-B-A-N-K-A-I-T-I-S.com. You'll find this to be a wealth of information. You can also go to the Oak Tree Products website where you will find a plethora of information on the topic of infection control as well as a number of other topics. Here's my contact information. The best way to reach me is at my email address, bkemp at oaktreeproducts.com. And I would like to open it up now for questions. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, sorry. Thank you for your presentation, Robert. I'm so sorry that I changed your name. Uh, I, I somehow got the wrong information. No, uh, no problem. Thank you for your presentation. Is there any questions? Then I have one question for you. Uh, you talk about tables and headphones and things like that. What about surface of instruments like audiometers and tympanometers? Is it uh, also impos uh, important to disinfect this surface as well because you were touching them and touching the patient? Um, yes, if, if there's going to be an instance where um, you touch the instrument and then touch the patient, um, uh, those surfaces should be disinfected on a regular basis um, with the intent of reducing the uh, transmission of organisms from one patient to another. And, and as, as, as remote as it may seem, you touch one patient and then you touch the audiometer and then the next person comes in and you touch the patient again. Um, after touching that audiometer, you have the ability to transfer germs from one patient to another. Is there any, uh, now you talk about the hearing aid re uh, research that you did about uh, the microorganisms. I was thinking, is there anything about instruments or any, any research on in, that, in that area as well? I've seen studies um, that look at things like stethoscopes, um, headphones, um, and uh, the, um, I've not seen anything looking specifically at uh, like an audiometer or a keypad of the audiometer um, or the dials or anything like that, but I have seen them for uh, other clinical supplies like steth stethoscopes and, uh, and headphones. And uh, it, it is, uh, it, it, those, those objects become quite contaminated and are uh, frequent sources of uh, cross-contamination. Okay. Is, is that as bad, uh, the results was as bad as, as with the hearing aids? Not quite. <laughs> Not quite. Yeah, that, that's what I thought. It's just, yeah. just curiosity. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. As I can see, there's no more questions. Then we are ending our webinar for today. And uh, in a month's time, we'll have another one. Thank you for all for participating, and thank you special for you, Rob. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.